my talk will be on uh, comparison designs and novel word generalization in children. I, may, I will consider object nouns and relational nouns. This is part of a project I'm running currently now at the lab with uh, different people I will show a picture of later on. So yeah, I wanted to tell you first that this is aperitif time here. So not the best time as you could see. So I wanted to share a glass of wine with you. A oh, very bad joke, okay. Um, so let's start on the, the general idea of novel name learning. So a very common and easy view on novel, learn, novel word learning might be that uh, it's only a question of association of a novel word with novel stimuli. It would be a very naive view, but it's probably shared and endorsed by the picture, book, picture books, which are supposed to be used by children and by many teachers. They think that the only thing to do is to associate pictures or objects with noun. But as we know, psychologists, it's not as simple as this. And what is a uh, novel name learning and what in many senses it's more of an association, but one of the reason why, when some of the reason why it's, it's more is that we have to find and children have to find deep conceptual reg regularities. We have to go sometimes on beyond superficial similarities, which might be misleading. Sometimes we're not misleading, but sometimes we're misleading. And also, even though we might have understood the meaning of a word or the situation in which it might be used, we also have to use it productively, which means generalize it properly to novel reference. And what does it mean? In the case of, for example, objects, it means not too narrow, for example, all the dogs and not too far. Again, for the dogs, not beyond dogs, for example, not wolves. So that's probably, um, and I will focus a lot on this generalization situation. So what, what could be the, what kind of situation might be introduced by picture books? Even it could be individual stimuli, like this, an apple, and somebody is pointing to the apple and say, this is an apple, or it could be more messy pictures, like pictures of categories. And here you would have to point, or the, the adult might point to the apple or the other fruits one by one and give the name and give their name. Or it could be representations of things in a context, for example, all the foods which are related to breakfast, breakfast food, and then same story, the parents or the adult might point to the different, each different food and uh, give its name. Or it could also be much more messy scenes like here. So in which you are, you have plenty, there are plenty of completely unrelated objects, for example, toothbrush in a bed, or I don't know, um, a bicycle and the fridge, these things are completely unrelated. So it's very messy. And what the child, the children have to do is to first understand which noun is mapped on which item and also remember which item was mapped was associated with each word, which is not so easy in a very messy world like this. So what is generalization here in this, let's say, um, illustration, illustrative context? So the, the basic idea of learning, vocabulary learning, novel noun learning in, in, in terms of generalization would be that with very limited learning evidence, most of the time, maybe just one stimulus, you must achieve, or children must achieve maximal generalization accuracy. So the main question of my talk will be whether there are methods highlighting conceptual similarities for better word learning and generalization. 
and I will emphasize and I will focus more on what we call comparison design. So the basic idea is just to have more than one stimulus belonging to one category and here in the task that would receive, that would be associative with the same word. Very simple situation. Before I come to this situation, of course, I should pay my respects to the huge literature on lexical and conceptual development. And of course, I cannot do this here. Maybe one thing that I can remind you is that there are plenty of studies on what are, what people call lexical constraints. So the idea is that the world is so messy that the child or children have to have to be biased towards some particular kind of meaning or some particular kind of information. And there is a famous shape bias, which has been received much attention and which was first described by Linda Smith and colleagues and later on described by other people in very different contexts, but it's not, the, and also with very different theoretical background, but it's not my story here. And also we, we know that there are lexical regularities in this course that can help children focusing on different kind of information. For example, very early during development, children know that when there is a, a, a regularity associated with adjective, he might not look for the same properties of objects. If he hear an adjective in a, in a phrase, compared to the same, to another word, which is introduced in terms, in, in syntactic term, in, in sy syntactic uh, terms, sorry, as a, as a noun. So nouns or adjectives, they would not um, call for the search of the same property, if you understand what I mean. So the summary of the talk is, my main point is comparison helps, and I will show briefly results in favor. And then most of this, the other um, illustration I will give are conditions that might modulate this role. And of course, conditions which are relevant to uh, lexical learning. And then I might turn to how children do compare, a little bit of eye tracking. Some of you may know that I'm fun fan and fond of eye tracking, maybe not because we are a bit late, but of course or we will see. We will discuss maybe psychological factors involved and last but, but not least, atypical populations in which voice um, comparison designs might be uh, intrinsic, intrin interesting too and where they might be also theoretically relevant. So learning a novel word, with this child looking in the book, and then suppose he has to learn the word apple. So this is an apple associated with the word apple. Quite uh, trivially, he should not extend, generalize the name to a thematic match, an apple tree or a knife that, can, that could be used to cut the apple. It could not, it should not be generalized to perceptual matches, which are not conceptually related like this Christmas ball. It doesn't mean that sometimes, of course, there are plenty of occasions in which uh, perceptual matches are correct, but here it wouldn't work. And at the end of the day, he should generalize the word apple to different kinds of apple, but it's not the end of the story. We know for since Eleanor Roche that there is a, uh, a different category levels in our classification system. And the child might be supposed to learn not the word apple, but the not but the word fruit. So the same um, the same stimulus should be associated with another word and with different stimuli, a broader category. It could, could also be even more, even broader. For example, in the case of food, apple is a food called a food, and it could include also the same word might include as you, 
meat, for example, which are quite different. Okay. Um, so my starting point is that comparing examples is a powerful tool, as we may read here, to find common non-salient dimension. And it's a nice situation that promote conceptually based generalization. And it has been shown in many situations for object names, for names of parts, action verbs, adjectives, perceptual categories, and so forth. For example, Gantner and Naimi, to name a few, have done wonderful uh, studies on this, on this subject. Waxman and Klibanov on, adject on adjective, Ch um, Jen Jane Childers and colleagues on verbs. So here is the design, the main result coming from a comparison design. Let's start first with a no comparison design. So you have a learning item, here there is only one, and the, the item is called, this is a DAX. And then there is the, the child has a choice between a perceptual match, which is clearly not taxonomically related, but perceptually related, and a taxonomy, taxonomy match, which is, of course, taxonomically related by definition, but which is much less perceptually similar. And it happens that in this kind of design, uh, a majority of children might go for the perceptual match. Now, let's introduce exactly the same situation in which you in, we introduce not one example of apple, but two examples of apples. So this is a, they would be these two apples, different apples here. They would be introduced as an apple and as a DAX, and the other one is also a DAX. And it happens that in this case, when the child is asked which one of these two is also a DAX, they go for, in a majority of cases, for the banana, that is for the taxonomic match. So the only difference between these two situations is that the presence of a only one learning item in the first condition and two learning items in the two conditions. And as you, of course, notice immediately in this design is that in both cases, the apples, the two apples here, or this apple are in both cases more perceptually similar to the perceptual match. And it was in, in fact intentional. So why comparison are, why are comparison interesting for learning? And one hypothesis is that they promote alignment of the stimuli on non-salient dimensions. And this comparison, second point, would allow to find less salient unifying dimension compared to the non, the no comparison dimension to the no comparison situation in which, of course, by definition, there is no possibility to compare. And that's your or um, left with only one stimulus and maybe you have only, you pay attention only to very salient dimension. And also when let's say a salient dimension is irrelevant, you, could, you can shift to a novel dimension. But, and that will be a point of this talk, comparisons, they don't come for free. If you compare, I'm sorry, with the no comparison case, in the no comparison case, there is only one thing that you look at and you have the, the dimensions in front of you. When you have to uh, compare, when you have the possibility to compare, and if you want to focus on non-salient commonality, commonalities, it means that you compare, and then maybe this might have, this might elicit cognitive costs. I will illustrate. So one thing that I would like now to focus on is the idea that there are different situations in which comparison might take place. And those, all these comparison situations might not be equivalent. And one important factor in the study of uh, concepts is the semantic distance, meaning that some items are closer one to the other, an apple, another apple or they, they, might, they might be more remote, like an apple and a banana under the, under the unifying category of fruits. 
So that's what exact that's exactly what I'm going to illustrate here: the role of conceptual distance between learning items that we could manipulate and between the learning items and the generalization items. Here is my uh, here is the um, the stimuli that uh, we used. <laughs> Let's look at current time on the screen. I have plenty of uh, small uh, pictures in front of my of my presentation, so I, I cannot see everything. Okay, during the learning phase, what we call it's already the same. You know this kind of trick. Developmental psychologists like to use. They refer to a puppet, and we have to learn. The kid has to learn the language, um, the language of the puppet. And that's why they are introduced with their non-words. This is a boxy, and this is also a boxy. So here we have a closed learning, as you can see, there are both bracelets. And what we called far learning was uh, a bracelet with something which was from another basic level category. Uh, in the closed learning, they were from the same basic level, and here from the same superordinate level. And then in the closed general generalization case, you had a taxonomic, the taxonomic choice came from the same category of uh, jewels. And in the far generalization, the taxonomic choice was even broader. The bow tie, and as in the previous, um, as in the previous um, uh, Example, we still have a perceptual choice rather than per perceptive choice. Perceptual choice, as you can see, there are closer. It has been, of course, rated around closer to the learning items than the other. So let's see when it's a forced choice case. Which one is also a boxy? It's important to keep in mind this is a forced choice case. And here are the results in the experiment I'm mentioning here, first experiment we did. So we have two groups, four years old and six years old. And then of course there were some reference point which was a no comparison. As you can see, there is a, um, these data are the proportion of taxonomic choices. So in the no comparison, as I said before, children most often selected the non-taxonomic, that is the perceptual choice. Six years old could figure out a little bit better that maybe they should use the taxonomic, the taxonomic choice, but remember that they, these stimuli were familiar. And what we see is that different thing. Of course, four years old are, have poor results than, than the six year old, it's no big deal here, but close comparison is always more difficult than far, forgive, sorry, not more difficult, give, poorer performance, close comparison than far comparison. So in my example, two bracelets led to poorer results than the bracelet and the, and the watch. So the idea was, why do we compare close and far? Because it could be argued that when you have two bracelets, it's, more, it's easier to find which are the commonalities than in the far learning case. But despite that, far learning is a better situation um, learning than a close comparison. And as you can see, and of course, again, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, you can imagine that it's easy to understand that near, oops, sorry, near generalization items were easier than a distant generalization in both age groups in each cases. In other words, it's easier to go to the, um, to the dual category than to go to a broader category. And which might explain why at some point for different reasons compared to reason which are really uh, usually uh, referred to in the literature, it could explain why um, taxonomic categorization is more difficult and different types of taxonomic categorization in, mean, in terms of level might be difficult, more difficult one compared to the other. Okay, consistency pattern, I can go, I can leave that. Um, this is a, 
Okay, now another situation which is exactly the same. The lexicon of nouns is not uh, composed of object noun, object nouns only. There are also nouns for relations. For example, neighbor as is not a word for object. It's a, it's a, to be a neighbor refer to a relation between some objects, some people, people and object. Addition is also a relational term. A bind is a relational term. A grasp they refer all to relation between objects rather than the object themselves. And it is well known in the developmental literature that relational concepts are more difficult than object concepts. And why? For a very obvious reason is that what, what you see when you learn a um, relational term, you see the objects that are interacting, but you don't really see the relation. So you have to figure out what this word might refer to and what it might refer to is a relation, something that is, that is not, I would say, visible. It can be more or less visible, for example, in the movie, but still, what you see is that when an object hit another, you, you can see that they hit each other, but uh, the, the thing which is more um, salient are the objects. And this is uh, also the case, for example, we can do analogy with verbs, which are also relational words. And it's well known that in the early lexicon, there is more um, object noun of object noun, sorry, than, uh, for, than verbs. So in the same way, it, um, these difficulties, uh, the difficulties which are associated with verb learning are the same than uh, the difficulties associated with relational concepts. Okay. So let's do exactly the same experiment with the with relations. So you have a no comparison case, and uh, this is a design coming from a paper from uh, Dedre uh, and uh, um, Florence Guru and uh, Klibanov in uh, 2011. And uh, what's going on here? So the idea is that to introduce a relational noun. So the knife is the boxy, again, a non-word for the watermelon. From that, you have to imagine something which is probably to be a cutter off. And then you have the same thing in a close comparison, um, in a close comparison uh, situation, which are context, which here we call it, we call it, you see immediately why, close comparison, because there are both the two uh, operators, as we call them, are knives, whereas here the two entities operated by the knives are from the same category. The, in the far comparison, we have a more heterogeneous learning concept with different operators, oper different kinds of uh, cutting thing, and also different kinds of food here, which would be cut. And then near generalization would be, the question would be, show me which of these three is the bug C for the paper, of course, you have the relational here. And this is more, it's a nearer generalization than here. And it was again, uh, how do I know? I know because we rated that, of course. So um, distant generalization were rated as more distant to the first, to the learning item than the near generalization. And what happened here is that again, no comparison is not very effective because you, as you can see with the dotted line here is the is random choice. And we were three years old and a four year old here. And then both age group, they were not very good. As you can see in, in the comparison cases, the task was pretty easy for them. But the interesting thing here is that in close comparison, it worked and it also worked in far comparison and um, near generalization again easier than distant generalization, but the difference here 
Here in the far comparison case, you see that the three year olds were not that much different from random, from chance. And here, whereas in the, in the four year old case, um, the far comparison more or less equated the close comparison, which is interesting in itself because it means that uh, something which, is, which cannot be seen as a relation is easier to conceptualize when uh, for the, these older kids than when, uh, uh, when than for the younger kids here, compare, if you compare this with this situation here. Again, okay, and I'm skipped that. So yeah, how do, in such a paradigm, how do children um, explore a situation and find a solution? So the way, the, the question here is a question of time cause of exploration and how we can, can we find a solution? Or is it, are there, is it only a matter of, is it a matter of strategies that might differ at different ages or, or what kind of strategies might, might we figure out? Okay, let's see, I'm going to do it very, very briefly too. So which strategies might they follow? One possibility would be something that we can call horizontal to be as neutral as possible. That would be start by comparing A and B. So that would predict lots of, um, lots of the transitions here. These are transitions between A and B, the learning items. Oh, okay, here the, the, the trial has been divided into three parts. So that's the, my first um, um, prediction. And then we could think that once they found the relation here between the two, they might look here and compare the three here in terms of what might be the relation that the common um, features here. So they compare that and then, okay, uh, there is one which here the banana, which seems to have the same deep properties and as the, the apple. So that would predict lots of these transitions between these objects here before the participants come to a, uh, a solution. Or the other, the other possibility, another strategy would be, let's call it vertical, that is after they compared, uh, yes, after they compared here, they might, or maybe they might not compare here, they might compare all the stimuli here, below with all this training, the learning stimuli, or it could be a combination of both. So let's look at the results. First thing first, the horizontal strategy doesn't seem to work very well since we didn't find many of these transition here. And um, the So very few of these uh, transitions comparing the, so between the items in the solution set. So it doesn't seem to fit well. And what we got, and which is more in, in phase with the vertical strategy is quite well, well, maybe not quite early in the beginning of the trial. What we found is here, um, those comparison between each of the solutions and uh, and each of the solutions and each of the learning items. But maybe there is something which was not predicted, which is that we should have at the beginning more a uh, transitions between A and B, and it was not exactly the case. But if we refer to the proportion of fixation times, this gives us an answer because as you can see, even though there are not so many transitions between A and B, 
they spend a lot of time exploring these two stimuli at the beginning of. So they might not compare them a lot, but they spend a lot of time on each of them. So that's more like a vertical trajectory. Well, next, next point is that there might be all these, as you, if you could see in my previous um, description, they were, there is an organization. So those comparisons are organized in, in time. So it could be that, uh, as I said before, maybe they involve some cognitive costs. And uh, if they involve cognitive cost, it could be that all comparisons might not be equal. I started to show real results in favor of that when I was looking at the conceptual distance during learning. And, uh, but there are other things that might play a role here. And for example, the number of standards. Here is an example coming from uh, a paper we wrote with uh, my colleague Arnaud Vita, and in which very simple design, we have uh, we manipulated the number of learning pairs. This is our, um, a situation in which we had the relational terms like the other before. Relations again. So we've, we hypothesize that if we, the more you get, the more information you get, the better you should do because you have more evidence in favor of the, of the relational choice. We also manipulated the, we also manipulated the distance uh, between the items, here for, you have all, all of these are knives and they are all foods, whereas here it's uh, the items, the pairs are coming from a more heterogeneous uh, domain. There are foods, there are trees, and everything is about cutting. So what were the results? It's interestingly, the, so don't, don't forget, we manipulated the number of pairs. And what's going on here is that having manipulated this number, it was, there was, um, there was um, a situation which was better than the others. And it was the free pairs. There is nothing magical. The, the, these children were free or old. There was nothing magical about free pairs. The, the point here was that if you, give more information, even though it's converging evidence toward the correct solution, more information could lead to worse, um, to worse performance in children. So, which is in favor of cognitive cost and the possibility for children or the impossib impossibility for children to homogenize or to understand uh, what's going on in such a situation where when the number of situation when the number of training stimuli increase exactly the same thing with another paper with Ogier but Luc Ogier former PhD student in which we compare a situation in which there was only one item two item or four items and we could have one contrast item this is not a buxy and the idea was whether or not they would be able to find that the correct choice would be the texture choice, knowing that, that a priori they would prefer shape match, which was of course uh, uh, checked before. And uh, we had four and six year old, okay. Okay, and look, what happens here is that when, if you come back to the stimuli, the, again, that's exactly the same reason. If we have more stimuli, we have more evidence in favor of the texture. Now, this is exactly what happened for the older children, the six-year-old, but not for the younger. As you could see, with four standards, four standards were not, was not better than two standards. Another way to look at it was, was is the what we call the patterns of consistency. So whether or not they, in the majority of cases, they choose texture. In all the, in all the trials, or all the trials, trials minus one, or whether they were shape consistent, all the trials they chose shape, shape, uh, the sh the shape match, or all minus one, or no consistency, which was everything in between. And what you can see here, for the four-year-old, there is 
the more you give them does not lead to better consistency, texture consistency, to more texture consistency. And then compared to the older children, with the more you give them, the more evidence we give them, the better they behave. Let's look at that. And also, even here in that case, when we give them a contrast, it could item, it could decrease their performance. They could not integrate something which is a comparison that goes in favor of uh, one category and a comparison that goes against the category. Whereas here, for the older kids, more information again led to better performance. So there are costs. It means that all these comparisons will not be. Uh, will not come for free and depending on the, the similar you get. Um, so that led us to more recent work on uh, monitoring, exploration of monitoring and directly try to assess whether executive functions might be uh, involved here. Inhibition, for example, cognitive flexibility. Yes, why inhibition? That because you offer the salient, the salient um, option, and this salient option is um, has to be inhibited. Or once you have seen that the salient option doesn't work, maybe uh, uh, it doesn't give you the correct answer. It doesn't mean that you will find the the, the, the correct uh, and less salient uh, solution, which was texture, or maybe you might be, you might have problem updating all your comparison in working memory. So it's just a, um, uh, a design in which we work with executive functions. And we also did that because there are other situations with comparisons like analogical reasoning in which it is well known now that there are correlations between analogical reasoning performance and um, an executive function which this has been done recently by sims and colleague which have, have done this very um, systematically so what we did here is a correlational study with unfamiliar st stimuli and we also uh, assessed word knowledge. So here is the test we use is the classical DCCS or a, on the computer version. Uh, it's, it's, it is supposed to assess the cognitive flexibility because the, ch the child is, to, is supposed to uh, first use one rule and then he has to switch to another rule when the experimenter ask him, asks him. And then there is also, this is for to study working memory. And this is uh, for, it's a Stroop test, which is uh, adapted for children and in which the children must not be influenced by the size of the, of the drawing because we're asked uh, whether or not in the reality, the, the, the the, the stimuli are bigger, are big or large. And these were the stimuli. So we, we have, uh, we have to find, we had to find, to find um, texture base or texture matches. So this is a dajo, this is a dajo, this, that's the usual story, you know it. And it happened that vocabulary did not um, did not correlate with categorization performance. The only thing which correlated with um, categorization performance, that is texture matches, was the flexibility score. Working memory explained nothing and inhibition also. So it's not, it seems to be not a problem of inhibiting shape, but rather to decide and go further and find the, and find the, the new the new relevant dimension. We also did that with familiar category, except exactly the same, but it's a work in progress. I don't have results now, or not. We have results, but it's very, not very compelling up to now. And then my last point is on. Um, 
but I would like to raise is on cognitive deficits and comparison. Why would we do, did we wish to apply these comparison uh, literature or, or to cognitive deficits because, because it's well known first thing that in cognitive deficits they in many many cognitive deficit cases there are difficulties to learn new language and this is the case for example in uh, in um, in um, uh, intellectual deficiency so they have difficulties to build a conceptual system so is it due to less because we have less knowledge or because executive functions are involved is, a, is also a, a question here so what is known in this literature? What is known is that, for example, in intellectual defi deficiencies, there is a delay, very, but sir, in uh, lexical learning. And uh, it's very well known that they can learn, when they can learn language, they can learn basic level categories, but much less superordinate categories. Subordinate categories are also a matter of, dif is also a matter of difficulty. And basically they, Despite all these difficulties, it seems that they have the same conceptual organization. And one reason why I wanted to look at for the comparison in cognitive deficits was that recently it has been shown that executive functions are less efficient in uh, these populations. So we thought that maybe it might be interesting to check whether we could improve the lexicon with comparison devices. But it could also be that they would have difficulties to monitor monitor these um, um, comparisons. So what we did is a first study with uh, typically developing children and children with uh, intellectual deficiency. They were basically between five and seven years of mental age, and they were matched, of course, on uh, with the um, the progressive. The, the the progressive method, the Raven progressive matrices, and the situation was you already know then we we work with object nouns and relational nouns. You know the design now, and then uh, quite surprisingly, it was completely unexpected because what we thought is comparison, especially if we manipulate manipulate a conceptual distance. Comparison would be will be harder for the children with intellectual deficiencies, and it happened that it was not the case. As you can see, for objects, the ID children were always better than um, the typically de developing children, and in for the relations, whatever they were, near learning or distant learning, same story for the relations. In no case typically developing children were better than the uh, children with intellectual disabilities. So, oh, but in fact, when we looked a little bit more carefully at the, at the, the data, it happened that the, in fact, what was more explanatory was the cognitive levels. And what we did is to separate, um, is to separate the children, whatever their status in high cognitive functioning. So they could be, there was a mixture of typically developing and atypically developing children. And, um, and uh, in high cognitive functioning and low cognitive functioning. And these two categories, these two groups, subgroups were um, done on the basis of uh, the scores on the matrices. As you, and you can, as you can see, uh, each time there is a difference between uh, the two groups, it's always in favor of high cognitive functioning children. So, so it seems to be uh, connected with their functioning. So the difference was quite expected, unexpected, unexpected but it seems that cognitive level was a discriminator here. But also there was a point in when we selected the children here, this study was done on 
children with mild, very mild intellectual def deficiency. So they were the limit, let's say close to 70, um, 70 points on the IQ, on the IQ scale. So we decided to go a bit further and do the exactly the same experiment, but with moderate, with children with moderate uh, intellectual deficiency. So we went for typically developing the control group, trisomy 21 as a population, uh, as a genetic based or intellectual defic in, uh, deficiency, and also intellectual deficiencies, people with intellectual deficiencies from unknown condition, but exactly at the same level. Why unknown condition? Because now uh, in the institutions, at least in France, there are plenty of uh, children, plenty, I don't know, it doesn't mean really anything saying plenty, but the majority of the people who come to our institutions are people with intellectual in deficiency from unknown conditions. So we did more or less the same experiment as before, except that we included here in the object case, uh, we included a thematically related match. And what happened, this is what happened in the typical, okay, for the typical children. I will focus on the typical children and the, tris the, tris the children with trisomy. And as you can see again, relational is better than taxonomic. You have here in the near test, uh, in the closed learning case, we are going massively for the um, for the um, for the perceptual choice, and then it increases a little bit here, which is typical of what we found here. That uh, they do a little bit better for far learning, and then let's let's look at immediately and what happens at the typically at, at the with, with the children with. The trisomy 21, and as you can see, oh, they're here, they're better in the easiest solution, the condition for the object case. This is the object, that the taxonomic, they were better here. Our choice is around uh, 30, here it's not 50%, uh, it's 33%. And then you see that uh, once uh, the, the thing, at which the condition at which we are the more, the most efficient is when it's a situation which is the easiest to homogenize, which is things which are very close to the other. And of course, they cannot be very far in terms of the, in terms of uh, uh, generalization, generalize. So there are, they can be more or less efficient in the near test, whereas, for the typically developing, uh, you have uh, uh, they are far more uh, efficient in the relational case. So the difference between the two, and we like this result. Maybe it's not obvious for everybody here, but we like the result because it's clearly what should be expected from the literature on um, on intellectual deficiency, which is it will it should be more difficult for them to find commonalities for relational um, for relational concepts because those concepts, as I said before, they point to relations. They don't point to the object themselves, and it's quite well known in this literature that children are most children are biased towards objects. So that's exactly what we were expected. So it's more expected than what we got in the first experiment. But what we think now is that maybe the situation were a little bit too easy for the, the, the children with intellectual deficiency in the first experiment. So they probably could here refer to their world knowledge since they, they're cognition was not too deeply affected. They are much older, of course, by definition, than the, uh, the control group. So we could refer to what they would know of the world. But here, it works much less. It's only the situation which are quite easy to homogenize that they can reasonably perform. In the other conditions, they are not very good. 
So if I can summarize these results here, and I, maybe I will stop here, typical pattern here in the typically developing children perceptually based answers for the objects. Um, the, D, the, the children, the, trism, the children with trisomy, they were, as I said, just close for learning and transfer. In they were, sorry, they were good for close learning and close transfer, and performance decrease with distance. And it was the same more or less with the relations. Okay, I wanted to tell a little bit about lexical generalization in DLD, another quite different condition, which is uh, what we call developmental language disorder, something what we did with a colleague and with a, some colleagues in Belgium, Magali Crémien here, she is uh, from the University of uh, Liège. And again, uh, we were interested by lexical generalization with and without comparison, but it's a little bit too difficult to, to compare different kinds of words. And the thing that I wanted to notice was exactly the same, but these children with more difficulties, of course, I should make the story, the story tell you a story a little bit more, um, a little bit more complete so that you can understand. But the interesting thing here that is that this, this population has more problems when it comes to spatial relation, relations again, or situation in which the, the properties you should refer to in, in usual noun learning are not based on shape. And that's exactly the data that the, the, what this graph is supposed to be. And it's also the case in, and that's what I wanted to point to, the, 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 the overall paper is not targeted at this, um, at this um, exactly on the, com it's not completely targeted on comparison. It's, a, it, it's only a side situation that we wanted to study, but it happens that in these children seem to use more rigidly the shape bias, for example, and that was kind of what our interpretation. And then when they have to refer to, when they have to learn words that do not refer to objects uh, defined by shape, um, they are in difficulties, also in the case of comparison. Okay, um, so to summarize comparison work, comparison conditions are not equivalents. We, I manipulate the distance, numbers, and other factors can modulate. It seems that executive functions can play a role in this comparison, especially cognitive flexibility, and then last point that the population with deficits could benefit from comparison but not in all conditions because we might have some difficulties in some of the conditions well uh, I, I should also thank uh, Ella that some of you have already encountered in this um, symposium and, and Anik is another student PhD student with his puppet his favorite puppet and Arnaud who is one of my colleagues here at the, at the department in France for listening to it. I'm sorry for all these difficulties. We also, we also um, manipulated our, okay. We also manipulated, for example, distinctiveness because we wanted to do an analogy with uh, super, uh, basic level categories and subordinate categories, which could be described as being uh, less distinctive than others. And it works quite well. So it could contribute to, so it could contribute to explain uh, why subordinate categories could be uh, uh, more difficult than other categories. And also other things that I won't refer to here. Okay, thank you for your attention.